Well, welcome to Finch Farmwood at the Blues Training Ground here in the Halewood district of Liverpool. And we are live from the Media Theatre for the Joe Royal Twitter Takeover. <laughs> Didn't have Twitter takeovers in your day, Joe, did they? No, no such social media at all. You just had to worry about the uh, letters page in the Echo. That was all. <laughs> the questions, as you would expect, are flooding in for Joe. So let's get straight underway. Somebody that goes by the name of Ice Cream Kone, Joe. Uh, here's a good question to start with. The biggest name transfer that you missed out on? Missed out on? Um, that would define, I suppose, players that we went down the road with and, and missed at the last minute. Obviously, the tour Andrew Flo was um, instrumental in, in my leaving here at the time. Our, our failure to get him, I was disappointed uh, with Nigel Martin and uh, not even coming to talk to us after um, after I, I couldn't be there on the initial day and of course he went to Leeds I, I felt he was wrongly advised by his agents to go to Leeds for the agent's own reasons when we had been talking to his agent and his previous manager Steve Koppel for a couple of months about him coming here so that was a disappointment on a different level of course um, we did ask, or, or we were informed, that Dennis Kurt Bergkamp was coming back, um, coming to England, sorry, not coming back. And um, when I actually got hold of his agent in the end, his agent said he wants to go to London. Not specifically Arsenal, where he turned up, but we did at least make a, a, ask the question. But the other two were certainly much further down the line, and they would be the biggest disappointments. Allied to that, of course, we did sign Duncan, did sign Gary Speed, Andre Kanchelsius, Nick Barmby, and a host of top players who came here. So I was very pleased with our dealings, but they would be the disappointments. Every manager could answer that question, couldn't they? Every manager misses out <clears> on big names. Every manager has a, a one that got away. Yeah. You know, I'm sure that Sir Alex, even who signed so many players, um, still regrets not getting gas going when he thought he had him. Yeah. And who knows where Gazza's fortunes and um, and career would have gone had he gone to Sir Alex who would have been sat outside his house every night at 12 <laughs> o'clock with a shotgun <laughs> but um, you know they no so we, we've all got sad tales and by the way anyway we're only kidding about the shotgun. <laughs> Kieran Hendry what was the feeling like winning the 95 FA Cup I suppose we'll, we'll narrow that down a bit what was it like when the final whistle blew? It, it was fantastic, but you know I've said many times that our big feat that year was staying up from the position we were in with, with eight points after a third of a season to finish with 50. To get to the cup final, really, we were so so switched off about it. You know, I'd, I'd had a chat with Willie and the coaching staff. Our, our, our training was almost non-existent until Thursday, and I told the players, the team, and um, we got serious about it. And the team talk was short. They knew what was required. We'd been playing a certain way. And um, I, I do remember a, a sort of semi-huddle and said, listen, we've come this far. We may as well win the bloody thing, you know. <laughs> so we, we went out and played as we knew. We'd already beaten United once. Mm. In our climb away from the bottom of the table, we'd beaten them at Goodison. Big Duncan scored a, a massive header at the far post, of course, and, and reeled away. <coughs> And um, we had no fears and no hang-ups about playing United. So it was a great game, and I'm not going to deny, I'm very proud to be the last Everton manager. I want to lose the tag this year, but the last man to win the Cup. But um, it was a great feeling. But when we, when we scored the goal that made us safe at Ipswich, when Paul Ryder bundled that one in, that was a bigger feeling, believe me. I didn't want to be... The, the man with the, on his CV that I took Everton down. It was some achievement, wasn't it, to keep Everton up from the position <coughs> we were in because the football club, as I recall it, as a supporter, yeah. was as flat as I've ever known it. We, we had one win in 14 games, and that was against West Ham, who, who seldom won north of Birmingham anyway. And, you know, we, that was the one win. And more than anything else, the first game was Liverpool, second game was Chelsea away, and the third game was Leeds. There were t three top six sides we had to beat, which we did with clean sheets, and we were up and running. And our form then from that first game onwards was probably sixth or seventh in the league um, projected through you know, through a full season. So now the, the turnaround was massive and uh, that is definitely top of my management CV. C.O. O'Keefe 999 has <coughs> asked, who was the best player that you played with? We've just been talking about it. I'm just sat upstairs mm. having a, a bit of lunch with... One James Ball, Jimmy Ball, whose father, of course, was Alan Ball. Alan Ball was 
the best player I ever played with. Anyone who played in that 1970 or in that 66 period onwards when Alan Ball joined the club, anyone who played with Alan Ball will tell you he was the best player we played with. He could run a game, a rare talent. He could control a game. A lot of um, a lot of footballers can be brilliant footballers. Gaza could run a game mm. at his best. You know, David Silva can run a game. It's very, very few players can do that. But Borley could do that, score goals, win the ball, nick the ball. Great motivator, great self-motivator, great spirit in the dressing room. And I've just been chatting with young Jimmy all morning about him and uh, I think the pair of us got a little bit tearful at one stage. Everybody everybody that played with Borley, everybody that knew Borley, misses him every day, don't you? Every game, well, every time you go to Goodison. I, I, was, um, I was in Radio City yesterday, if I can mention that here. I, I was doing a, an interview of the same thing and... The question came up, what would Alan Ball be worth today on the market? I just said, start at 80 million and then go, and then go. well, just think. I mean, Bale was 80 million yeah. and I think he's fantastic. I wish he was in a blue shirt, but he didn't run a game. Mm. He certainly embellishes a game. He scores goals, he <laughs> makes goals, he does fantastic things and he's a brilliant player. But Alan Ball ran a game and it's, it's a rare talent and... Uh, Starts at 80 million. Name me, you know, if you, if you look at Arsenal paid, what, 40 plus for Ozil, who's a World Cup winner? Starts at 80 million. And work our way up. Middleton wants to know what did you say to Mike <coughs> Walker's team to lift confidence when you first arrived? Um, <coughs> I told them straight away we were going to have to play a specific way to get out the problems that we had. I, I'd gone away along with Willie Donachy, um with our arms full of VHSs as they were then, <laughs> of the games that Evan had played and we both came back with similar words, soft touch. So we had to make us harder to beat. Everybody told me that Waggy Dave Watson was finished. Fans were telling me Neville was over the top, you know, that so-and-so couldn't do this and so and could So we had to put a barrier in front of the back four to give them a chance again. And we did that. We played the three midfield players together, you know, and, and they, they were the base and all of a sudden, Neville wasn't a bad goalkeeper anymore. He's still the best you've seen at, at knowing what to do and where to be. A, a great positional goalkeeper, an 85, probably the best in the world. Dave Watson still knew how to defend. There was just not enough going on in front of him. You know, they, they were being got at. So we worked for 10 days on pressing and closing, being a team, playing as a team. Andy Hinchcliffe was in the reserves. John Eberl was in the reserves. Joe Parkinson were in the reserves. They were all back in. So I brought players in who I knew wanted to play for Everton and were proud to wear the blue. Andrew wants to know, which player in the current squad would you have liked to have played with? Of course, that means who impresses you the most, doesn't um, it? The current crop. There's a lot to recommend about the current crop. I'm just trying to think. You've got to recognise the talent of young Ross, you know, and you see the awesome physique on the guy. Mm. Um, his... He's not so much a provider. I think that'll come with Ross as he goes on. And I know certainly the manager has high hopes for what he's going to add to his game. What he does now is terrific. Um, as a, Personally, I would have done very well from Leighton Baines' service. He's as good a crosser of the ball as you've seen. Um, we... We didn't have actually a great service from left, although the defensive side with Sandy was always good. He was a right footed left back. Ray Wilson was coming to the end of, it, of his career, you know, but never was the overlapping full back. But I, I do mm. think sometimes I see the way that Leighton Baines fizzes balls across the box and thinking, mm. someone's got to be there. I might, <laughs> I might well have been there. <laughs> <laughs> a centre forward's dream. Yeah. Jojo EFC says, What's the stupidest thing you've ever done? Um, must involve Westy or somebody. Oh, <laughs> God, Westy. Um, three of us dancing around the room at three o'clock in the morning with Westy waving a tickling stick, yeah. <laughs> I hope that was after the game. Yeah, before, no, was it? it was before the game. But I think we, we'd already won the league, so it didn't matter. We were very professional no matter what. Um, daftest thing I've ever done. Uh, I bought a, an Audi 200 Turbo off a fella in Norwich who I knew sold hooky cars, so that was quite daft. I thought that I'd get the good one off him. Um, I don't honestly know, really. That I think I've always been more towards Captain Sensible rather than the <laughs> rather than the Looney Tunes side of football. Certainly nothing. I had a night in, in a room with Gazza once and woke up to all my clothes missing. So that was daft, even <laughs> trusting him in the bedroom. Absolutely. Yeah, so... 
No, it's a hard one to answer that. You'd have to ask. Perhaps my wife would say, Marion. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Kareth Atkinson, you've probably been asked a million times, but did Daniel Amakachi really just bring himself on at Ellen Road in the 95 semi final? Yes. (laughs) I told him to get warmed up. Get warmed up, Daniel. And he must have thought I said, You're on, because they sound very similar. (laughs) And um, I'm waving at Les Helm, the physio, you know, how's poor ride out going to be? And Les is giving me the sign that says, wait and see. I think he's going to be OK. I think he's going to be OK. Get warmed up, Daniel. He's, How's he doing? How's he doing? He's on the pitch. He's on the pitch. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Scored two. Missed two. <laughs> In the final. Yeah, the so it, it was the made. best substitution I never made. <laughs> um, we've got Blue Boy 79. What happened to Andre Kanchelskis? What a player he was, by the way. Yeah. He gave us... It, it's funny, speaking with Evertonians, that when they're asked about their best team ever, a lot of them put Andre in on the strength of one season. I think it was 32 games, 16 goals, no free kicks, no penalties. Um, and he was awesome. He, he got a niggling injury, and I, and I said in, in, in a book that I did a while ago that looking back in hindsight, I probably should have sent him back to Russia for a month to clear his head. I know he was having marital problems. I know that he was having injury problems. And I, I know all this now. But he hadn't he hadn't settled. Uh, the Italians also were getting in his head. After after Euro European games, you know, I knew that the, the agents I knew the agents and didn't physically threaten him, but I I made it clear I wasn't happy with him. But they got they got into him and the money that they were paying then in Italy, um was just phenomenal compared to what Premier League players were, were earning. So it turned his head, quite honestly. Mm. I still see Andre occasionally. Uh, I still get a call from him at Christmas, and uh, he's a nice man, but his head got turned. And it's a shame because instead of everybody thinking what a great player he was, he should be seen as a, an Everton legend mm. because he was awesome. Here's a good question from Earl Dunn. Who was the best defender you ever played against? Roy McFarland. That didn't take much thinking. No, Roy. Roy's the best centre half I played against. You know, but uh, that would surprise a lot of people, Joe. I would think. Yeah, well, it's quite simple. You know, he he's a good mate as well. We we both have a an apartment on the same development in Mallorca, and I see Roy most summers. Uh, played for England with him, and he was a late developer. Of course, he was a Tranmere. Came in later on the, the famous story about when Brian Clough went to speak to him and um, talk to him, and he knew that Liverpool were slightly interested and wanted to go there. He was a red, so he he, he said to Mr. Clough, "Can I tell you in the morning?" He said yes, and Brian Clough got a blanket out of his car and went to sleep on his couch, <laughs> and he wouldn't leave until he signed. <laughs> so he signed for Derby County, but it, quite simply, you know, as a centre half, he was quick. He was. Good on the ball, uh, he was as tough as you want him to be, and um, I scored a couple against him later on in my career. One for Everton, bundled one over the line at Goodison, and one when I turned at Man City and slotted it. But I knew if I was playing against Roy, it was going to be a hard day. Hey, Zaid, how was Anders Limpar as a player to manage? Anders was no trouble. He, he, he was a bit eccentric. For want of better a better word, you know, he would as soon as I got the team sheet on a, a match day, he would come and say me as to who the fullback was. I said the same thing every week, you know. Oh, he's quick, isn't he? Landers, there's no one on this planet quicker than you over ten <laughs> yards. You know, he is honestly ultimate from a standing start. His pace was immense, and he probably the most talented player that that I, I managed. In really? the terms of innate talent, if you, he would do things on the training ground that you you just couldn't imagine. You know, a, a fantastic talent. You know, but he, he was inconsistent, and uh, and his his game could be determined so easily by the first five minutes on the ball, uh, as whether it went well for him or not. He, he he couldn't pick a game up if he had a bad start, mm. but he played a massive part in our our recovery. In uh, 94, 95, he played a massive part in us winning the FA Cup 
and he, he, he was a smashing little fella, but a, a little bit eccentric. Well, that's allowed. I don't of mind. Of course it. it is. I don't mind eccentric. Played a great part in us staying in the Premier League as well he, with that. He did. When he was scythed down in the penalty area against Wimbledon. I know, yeah. It was a great <laughs> catch. <laughs> Um, Chris McLean says, do you think Joe Parkinson would have become an England international if it weren't for his injuries? I don't think Joe would have done. I know he would have done. Terry Venables had already been on. Um, Joe was a fantastic holding midfield player. He was a little ahead of his time that before the, the country, the Premier League, was starting to recognise the position. Uh, he was an almost centre-half he was good on the ball, very, very quick for it, for his size, over 10 yards, um, aggressive and a fantastic boy as well, you know, who wanted to do well. He was <coughs> he was one of my biggest successes in so much as he was in the reserves when I... My first game as a manager for Everson was actually against Liverpool reserves at Anfield and I watched him for 10 minutes and saying, well, there, there's one name on the team sheet for the next game because he was exactly what we wanted. He a shield in front of um, Dave Unsworth and, and Dave Watson. And he could play as well. You know, mm. he, he was great on the board. Joe would have had caps. Venables was very aware of him, and but for knee injuries, which, which is a tragedy. He would have had many caps. Uh, back to a current player, Mark Owen says, um, what do you think of the form of Stephen Naismith? I've just been sat with Nays at lunch, and do, do you know something? He's a, he's a credit. He's a really nice guy. There's, there's no edge to him. And he's he's done one of the hardest things it is. He, he's changed people's opinions. Mm. You know, when he came here, everybody thought, well, OK, he's, he's going to be on the bench, so it's OK. And he's, he's, you know, he can play a little bit wide right. But he's done fantastically well. And uh, he's worked hard. He loves playing for Everton. He's become a blue, you know, a, a, a big blue. Mm. And he's a nice guy. And, and you, you fans out there should be very proud of him because he's proud of you. Matt Jones, did it take much persuading to come back to Everton again? <coughs> it, w- it was a strange one for you, wasn't it? it, it listen, it, it wasn't minutes, it was seconds. That wasn't, mm-hmm. There wasn't a problem. The problem was I wanted to work in football again. <coughs> I'd spoken with Roberto about this role, which he'd envisaged last February, and he wanted to, and it never quite developed for whatever reason. He had his hands full with the first team. And then, of course, with... Um, with uh, Alan Irvine going in the summer, Alan Stubbs going taffy, all of a sudden there were one or two holes in the academy system. And to be fair to him, he, he'd said at the time he was going to give me time to see if I wanted to do it. Or he said that to Bill Kenwright. And um, when they rang me, I was at Norwich, where Neil Adams had asked me to go and help him. And I was just settling into that. I was about to sign up for an apartment on the river in Norwich. And uh, Bill Kenwright came on and said... Um, Roberto's away, but he wants to do it. He's still up for it. How long does yes take? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody absolutely delighted to have you back. But let me ask yeah. you about Neil Adams. He's doing a decent job there. Doing very well, Neil. <clears throat> he, he had coached, of course, the Norwich side that won the Youth Cup. Mm. Uh, I think, I'm not sure, but I think they beat Everton on the way to doing they it. And um, he's well respected. He, he's, a, he's a good coach. He's an honest guy. And he's not frightened of making decisions. I think Neil will do very well there. I'm still in touch with him. Of course, he was another... I signed him from Everton when I was an Oldham manager. And um, he, he wanted me to help him along all the the quirks rather than the day-to-day coaching that, yeah. that management can bring. And uh, we're still in touch, you know, and he, he's a good guy. It's, it's great to see him doing well there. Well, Norwich is a nice club, though. Yeah. You know, I have great affection. <laughs> I scored the, the last goal that I ever scored as a footballer for, for Norwich. Says he was a Goodison Park, actually. And um, we, we beat Everton 2-0, Justin Fashion who scored. And later that evening, I'm led to believe the first contact was made to come back for, for Howard Kendall. So oh. one way or another, our, our fates have still been <laughs> intertwined. <laughs> Tom McGarry, who was your role model? Which, which players did you like when you were a kid? <clears throat> um, my first Everton hero was Dave Hickson. You know, they, they, now I've said many times now that I used to watch Dave Honest as the days long, certainly not the most skillful player you've ever seen. Um, sharp elbows, <laughs> and, uh, but when he put the blue shirt on, he, he cared and, and he, he loved playing for Everton. I also was um, a fan of Bobby Charlton, you know, and, and who couldn't be? You know, a man who survived the Munich Air disaster in 1958, played for England as a striker, 
played for England in midfield, played for England outside left. What a player, what a marvellous player. But but Dave Hickson was my first first uh, Everton mm-hmm. hero. And then I was stood on the paddock when Alex Young made his debut. And oh, nice. to to play with Youngie later on was, was a privilege. And um, jaw dropping for a, a blues. I can imagine. Yeah, I can imagine. Was. It leads me nicely on to a question from Omar, who says, who's the best striker in the world currently? Which which centre forward do you like the look of these days? I can't say, really. Um, he used to wear red, probably. <laughs> I'm glad he, he's gone. Absolutely. <laughs> you can't look past it, Suarez. For all the foibles that he has, um, and, and there are many, the actual 90 minutes on a football pitch that he gave Liverpool, well, you've seen the difference for them this year. You know, you've seen the difference. They've lost the, the pace and the energy and the, the goal scoring ability. And long may it rain. <laughs> uh, Luke Connor, what do you make of the job that Roberto Martinez has done here at Everton? Well, I've got to be nice about the boss. <laughs> yeah, we both have. <laughs> yeah. Listen, no, 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 joking apart, I, I don't think I'm, I'm famous for sugar coating anyway. He's, all I can say is, is this he's exactly what he seems. It's not an act. And then you go from there. Because he's a dead decent guy, he's got time for everyone. He's just met Jimmy Ball in the canteen and give Jimmy a quarter of an hour. Um, and Jimmy's come away absolutely drooling. So, now what you see is what you get. And, and I, I don't, that's not damn with faint praise. He, he's a good guy, he cares. He's first in, he's last out. Um, if he sacks me tomorrow, that won't change. <laughs> I'm sure he won't. Two more questions to <coughs> Joe. Uh, Andrew Rowland, what, what's your abiding memory from your first game as the manager? As manager? Mm-hmm. Um, the, a silly one, really. That Peter Johnson, the chairman, had said to me as we sat down, I always watched the, the first half in the stands, and we sat down and he, he said, do you think we can possibly get a draw out of this? And I said to Peter, <coughs> I expect us to win. Uh, and I meant it, and he looked at me as if I'd just landed from another planet. And then after the game, um, everyone was euphoric, as you can imagine, that um, we stayed on a bit to have a few drinks and let the crowd disappear. And there was a knock on the boardroom door and um, the, the, one, of the, one of the stewards came in and said, Joe, will you go over the road to the Winslow? Because they won't go. <laughs> and quite honestly, they won't go. So I went to the Winslow and it was riotous and... Uh, I, th- I think the fact that nobody really expected it, expected it, m- makes it even better. And my youngest son at home, of course, who, who couldn't come to the game, he was too young at the time, and he'd um, taped the whole game for us. And whenever the, I get together with my sons, you know, at, at least once a year, we, st- we still watch the game. And I'm always amazed at the noise when Duncan's first goal, you know, went in. The, the roof moved. I swear the <laughs> roof moved. It was there's still nowhere like the old lady, like the mm. the place that we all love called Goodison Park. I know it, it's a help and a hindrance at time, but the roof moved. And uh, Darren, I'm tingling now. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm seriously tingling now. It made now. Duncan, didn't it? It did. I mean, the, the, the legend that was Duncan was born the, the night after being breathalyzed. He scored <laughs> his first goal for the club after five weeks without a shot. <laughs> And then he went on and became a talisman that led us away from the bottom. Finally, and possibly an impossible question from Anne Black. What is your all-time one fondest memory from your whole time at Everton Football Club? <coughs> um, it's a few to choose from, isn't there? Uh, th- there are literally too many. Scoring my first goal mm-hmm. at Anfield, scoring my first goal for the club, playing my first game, walking out for England, uh, managing Everton... Managing Everton at Wembley, uh, and that's that's the tip of the iceberg. Twitter so, takeovers. Twitter takeovers. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a very big Twitterer, <laughs> but uh, no, I, honestly, the, there's too many. I, I've got to say that you know, coming back third time around, I signed my first contract for for Everton as a 14 year old 51 years ago. So one way or another, with uh, little interludes away, you saw some longer than others. Everton's been in my blood so um, it, it was nice at 65 to be wanted and, and I mean that now that's mm. a, there is ageism in football 
I tried for one or two managerial jobs, not a lot, because I've been choosy, but um, it was nice to be asked back at 65, so thank you, Roberto. There you go. It's been an absolute pleasure to have Joe Rowe alongside us. An Everton debut at 16, and not just any debut, a centre-forward to the most revered position in the history of the club. A league title winner, an FA Cup winner, more than 100 goals. That's what you call an Everton legend. And there'll be a chance to enjoy the contribution that the legends have made on Saturday when we play Aston Villa on what we've themed Retro Day. We'll have full live commentary on EvertonFC.com. My thanks to you for joining us. My thanks immensely to Joe Roy. Thanks, Derek. Good afternoon. <laughs>